Will you join me now as we bow for prayer together? Father, we come before your throne and we are so grateful, even as we have just sung, that the faithfulness that you show, the promises that you have bestowed upon us, your grace is for every day that we live on this earth. And even more, as that life that you give us through Jesus Christ extends on into eternity. We thank you, God, for the ways that week by week, day by day, you answer the prayers that we bring before your throne. We thank you for the answered prayer and Diane Anderson being back with us in her leg healing. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have sustained those who are walking through the darkness of depression and anxiety day by day to follow you and to find hope in you. We thank you, O oh God, for the ways that you have given us wisdom and guided our footsteps. We thank you, O oh God, how you have cultivated in our hearts and continued to move on us by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to you, to nurture us and to enliven us to serve you. God, we bring you our offerings this morning with, from grateful hearts and cheerfully seek the, the benefit and the growth of your kingdom. Would you use us and our resources to bring your good news to hearts that need it. We pray, oh God, as we now approach your word, would you open not just our eyes and our ears, but our hearts to receive what you have for us. And in so doing, Lord, make us more like Jesus. Refresh us in our heavenly calling and enliven us in our service to you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it is a sweet thing to hear the testimonies of the youth this morning and the summary of their trip. And in the spirit of summaries, we are summarizing our sermon series in Revelation in the seven churches. So if you take your Bible and open to Revelation chapter one, we're going to be thinking through what uh, Jesus has said summarizing and hopefully bringing some of those things home. Next week, we'll start a four-week series in the Psalms, and I'm excited about that. We'll be hearing from some elders and Tyler and uh, brother. So um, excited about the Psalms series, but this morning, we're going to uh, wrap up and hopefully sharpen and deepen and secure the call of Jesus that he has issued to us personally as a body over these last few weeks. My prayer is that as we let these messages crystallize and distill in our hearts, that we won't live the wrong life, that we won't end up pursuing a mistaken version of the good life, but that we end up being here at World Gospel in our, in our own lives to be people who are conquerors, and not those who are conquered. And to get our heads in the game, I want to turn us back to where we started in chapter one, where we behold the image of Jesus that he has given us of himself. The image of Jesus that he presents of himself is what drives the letters to the churches. It's what drives his commands and his calls. It's what shapes all of who we are as his church. So let's pay careful attention to who Jesus describes himself to be. In chapter one, we're gonna begin reading in verse 12 and read through verse 20. Revelation 1, 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, 
the seven stars, the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Here Jesus appears to John to convey this image to his church, this, this image burning and vibrant with life and authority and holiness. Jesus is addressing the church that in verses five and six, he loves and has freed from their sins by his blood and ransomed by his blood as a people for his own possession. Every tribe, language, and people, and nation. And he did this to make us a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. So we hear from this revelation this message from God on high that that Jesus loves us and Jesus has freed us and Jesus has made us a people for God, kingdom and priests to God the Father. And of this Jesus, John says in in Revelation 1, 7, behold, this Jesus is coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him as we sang in the song just a few moments ago. Jesus came to save sinners and he united those sinners to himself and his body, the church. And Jesus has a plan for us as his priests and his kingdom to extend that call to the nations as our youth did in our mission trip, as we support our global workers to do. And he has called each of us individually to be engaged in. Is Jesus is the foundation of everything that God is building, the only place where life is found. He's the victor, he's the ruler, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords over human and spiritual forces. But Jesus knows that his people, even his very own people, can lose sight of this, can get discouraged or disillusioned, worn down, distracted, And so the letters in this book that we have looked at are nourishment and wisdom and vision for God's kingdom and priests so that they will endure and advance his kingdom, that they will conquer with him on earth with the certainty of his return before us. That explains the format of the letters written to specific churches You see the circuit there one last time from Ephesus north and around back down south to Laodicea. And all these letters were written to specific churches, read by each of the churches, but applied to all of us in the closing formula by saying that Jesus spoke to us through the Spirit to the churches. Each of the letters has a similar structure, and we're going to follow the structure of the letters as we we summarize what they say, but as we crystallize what they say, Jesus says, I know, at the beginning of the letter, showing he's present and fully aware, he's close to us. Jesus then speaks, says the words of him, and then he gives a declaration of who he is in these church-specific communications. And then he wraps up with a command. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear as he calls us to be the ones who conquer, who are part of his conquest. So we're going to look through the, through the letters with that framework, closeness, communication, command, and conquest. The first striking thing that Jesus highlights in these letters is his closeness. Jesus knows and Jesus is here. He starts off each one by saying, I know. Have you ever been tempted to pray in short-sightedness and started off a prayer this way, maybe even finish the sentence, but say, God, you just don't know what I'm going through right now. But these letters show us that that's just not the truth. Jesus knows our circumstances and us better than we do. And he's here. He knew the works of these churches in detail. He knew everything that was going on in Ephesus and Thyatira, Sardis and Philadelphia, Laodicea, and he knew that they were failing. He knew in other churches, in, particularly in Smyrna and Philadelphia, how they were doing well. He knew their tribulation and their poverty. He knew the city that they lived in. Jesus knows it perfectly because as we heard, he's walking among the lampstands. He's present with his church and he is present with us now as he was then 
Jesus, by his spirit and with his very real presence, is here right now, knowing everything that's going on, knows World Gospel Church like the back of his hand, we're written on his heart. Jesus is truly among us. We see this by the highly contextualized images and the knowledge that Jesus has of their geography, their water supply, what they worship in that particular city and, and where it's situated, what they sell and what they wear and where they're tempted. Jesus knows all of these things. And if you think about it, Jesus, when he was on earth, had never been to Turkey. Jesus knew it because in his ascension, he was present at every point of time with all of his children. He knows because he's here. And he can see beyond what everyone else sees. He sees beyond our reputation. He sees beyond the way society has marginalized us. He sees beyond our appearances and image. And he sees with piercing clarity into our hearts so that he knows the exact correspondence between what we have inside of us and what comes out in our actions. There's no division or confusion for him there. He understands us in our weaknesses. He knows our stories. He lives here in our cities. He knows our strengths. He knows our needs. He knows our hearts. Jesus has spoken to his church. Jesus' communication comes to us in his word, it says. The word of him conveyed to us the voice of Jesus on the pages of the word of God. Jesus has spoken. This is what it means for this to be the revelation of Jesus, the, the direct communication of God where he has cut through the mist of philosophy and speculation with direct and uncontaminated statements that are faithful and true to us. Now we may approach revelation with a tendency to say, okay, here's the code, and if I just crack the code, I get the specific people and the circumstances and I can identify and figure it all out and... Yeah, after a little while, you start to realize, wait a minute. <laughs> That's, that, that keep, it keeps changing and everything keeps shifting. I can't figure that code out. But when you approach Revelation as hearing the voice of Jesus for where we are now to prepare us to conquer as victors through the days ahead and until the return of Christ, boy, then Revelation takes on a new life for us. Jesus is self-identity. He says the word of him is driven, his word is driven because of his person and derives from his person. The churches were missing something about Jesus and they needed a specific revelation or, or reminder of who he was. They had been missing Jesus for who he is. If they were to conquer, it would be as their profession and their practice remained living and active until the end. And so for the five Churches that received rebuke, they had problems. We see that Ephesus had lost its first love. They had doctrinal purity. They had a well-ordered church government. They were patiently enduring, but they just lost track of Jesus. And yet Jesus had not lost track or his love for them. There he was calling them back to their first love. They needed to hear that Jesus was the one who loved us and freed us. Smyrna they were afraid, even though they were faithful, they were afraid of suffering. And so Jesus encouraged them, I am the first and the last. Rome will come and go. Your persecutors will rise and fall, but I will remain. Serve me and live for me. I'm the one who died and came to life. In Pergamum, they, weren't, they were holding fast to Jesus' name, but teachers had come in and said, Jesus is compatible with sexual immorality and with idolatry. You can have it both ways. But Jesus spoke with piercing and destructive force against those caught up in that teaching. He spoke as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. It's not being rejected by the culture that we should be concerned with. It's being rejected by Jesus. We shouldn't be concerned about the sword of Rome, but the judgment of Jesus. So Thyatira was a church that had faith and works and endurance but they had a false prophetess who authoritatively proclaimed the same thing, that idolatry and immorality were approved by God. And Jesus wouldn't have it. It says that their, their garments were getting dirty with these sins, and Jesus won't have an impure bride. 
He's preparing for himself a holy bride. And so he called them out of that. With eyes of fire, he pierces through the darkness and sees with absolute clarity into us. With feet of burnished bronze, he would come to crush those whose works led them away from him. Even saying that he would strike dead in the church those who acclimate to the culture. In Sardis, this was the church of the living dead. They had no works because they were not keeping the word of Jesus. They were insensible to the kingdom and the Savior. And yet Jesus came to them as the one with the Holy Spirit. The one who makes us alive. The one who brings God's word alive within us. And he offered them this vibrancy. But if nothing changed, Jesus would come swiftly against them. He said, keep my word and repent. To the church at Philadelphia, the church in the city of brotherly love, they, they were encouraged to hold fast because they were facing poverty and demands to deny Jesus. And the religious establishment of the Jews were saying, you're not really followers of Yahweh. But Jesus revealed himself as the Holy One, the True One. He opens the doors to eternity and no one can shut them. And he shuts the doors and no one can open them. They will be kept by him even as they keep hold of him. And they will be publicly and eternally vindicated as the beloved of God. Finally, we see Laodicea. Life was easy and comfortable and prosperous and everything was fine at Laodicea, right? Jesus didn't think so because they'd gone lukewarm. They'd lost their witness and their distinctiveness as followers of Jesus. They were saltless salt. They were light under a bushel. Jesus is the amen, the faithful and true witness. The church is his and even when his oblivious sheep shut him out. He is the one who pursues us in love with the reproof and discipline we need to be restored. And so he called them to be zealous. And he gave us that, that heartbreaking image of Jesus outside the church, knocking on the door, trying to get back in. But he says, hear my voice and open the door and I'll come in with you. And he calls us to be reunited to him in fellowship. And as we heard in that meal, that doing life together where you're committed to one another and on the same sheet of music. Jesus also knew that just like it is today when you hear a sermon, it's so easy to, to, to get up and leave and for us to just sort of forget the thing that we just heard. Isn't that easy to do? I preach the sermons and sometimes I have a hard time remembering them, right? But Jesus, so he leaves this, his, his, each one of his letters with the same command at the end. He says, he says to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear the, the words of God breaking through the mist of the fog of, of human understanding to speak to our hearts. It sounds weak. It sounds kind of like Jesus is saying, just, you know, let him hear. But in the Greek, this is really a command, an imperative. He's, he's shouting out to us, listen. Attend to what I've said to you. Order your life by it. Hear the authority with which I'm speaking to you. Hear the love that's in my heart pursuing you. Allow the truth of what I'm speaking to you to penetrate down into your heart and filter its way out into your actions and lives. Make yourself attentive to me and attend to what I have said. That means that we give him our attention. We stay with it until we get it. We keep his word, we hold on to it. That's the point of a wrap-up message like this so that the message distills down and, and even more that we would meditate upon it. That it would begin to filter out into what we really value and love and how we order our lives through our priorities. And as we do that, it will feed into our attending Following Jesus is not just checking things off of a to-do list. Following Jesus is, is allowing him to shape and direct our hearts based on his new reality. It's our whole being being given over to service to Jesus. The church in modern evangelism and evangelicals have colossally failed in this regard. 
Evangelists have pointed people in the past toward a moment of profession for Jesus instead of calling people to a lifetime of following Jesus. Jesus isn't looking for likes. He's not looking for five-star reviews. He's not looking to just give you some Jesus-branded merch or to give you a membership card to the Jesus Community Center, right? Jesus is calling his bride to himself. To forsake our attachment to the world. To attach instead to him. For our allegiance to be given to Jesus. To trade this world for his world. This world for his kingdom. And so hearing Jesus' message and keeping it, that's what maintains a believer's kingdom life active. We hold on to that reality. We live that reality By the power of the Holy Spirit, through the gift of Jesus Christ, we're empowered for that and enabled for it. Through the gift of his word, we're nurtured and nourished in it. Jesus is constantly pressing back into our lives as we get distracted and are tempted to wander. Jesus, God has blessed us with seemingly limitless pleasures. All around us are beautiful sights, We enjoy so many bodily comforts as gifts of God to us. But these comforts are not God's priority for us. We have been made citizens of a kingdom on the move. We've been made priests to God. The things that matter to God and his kingdom are his glory and the spread of his kingdom to the nations. That explains why keeping Jesus will be attended with suffering and labor, and persecution, and even death as priests of God in this world. And so Jesus is calling us to keep and hold on to him through his commands so that we are part of his conquest and his victory. We've been reading the ending of Revelation together and reading through what Jesus is doing in Revelation and his victory. And we know that Jesus wins in the end. He wins and his victory is absolute. There's no place for Satan and those allied with him in his kingdom and in the future. And so Jesus is working to make sure we're part of his victory so that we have his vibrancy and his victory. Each one of the letters is concluded with this statement and he's keeping our eyes on the prize. And so I want to collate all the blessings to the one who conquers and then he said, this is what they have. He says that that we'll be granted to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We will not be hurt by the second death, nor be cast into the lake of fire. We will receive some of the hidden manna, a white stone with a new name written on it. We'll reign with Jesus in authority over the nations with a rod of iron, crushing the enemies of Jesus. We'll receive the morning star, which is the picture of Jesus himself. We'll be clothed in white garments of the holiness of Christ. We'll never have our name blotted from the book of life, but instead have our names declared by the very lips of Jesus. They kept me and I keep them. We're made into pillars in the temple of God, meaning we never are driven from that place and we enjoy fellowship and worship for God forever. We're granted to sit on the throne of God with Jesus, which means that we will ultimately be elevated above every nation or system or wealthy, powerful person who has ever existed in our victory with Jesus. Jesus wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus wrote these letters so that you and I would not miss out on that. And so the question that we have for ourselves this morning is this, will I, will I connect with Jesus in his presence here? Will I keep his word? Will I be one of the ones who conquers by the power of God? If we were to distill down the responses that we need in order to enact the reality of Jesus' presence and his call in our lives, we could put it into two words. First, that we would attach ourselves to Jesus It's just a way of saying that we hold on to him, we connect with him, and then we attend to Jesus. This is how we stop settling for the good life and we start finding the true life. It's how we press on to conquering. 
Now you may be wondering, how do I attach to Jesus? That sounds kind of abstract. Does Jesus even want to attach to me? Does he have an expectation? Or is it that Jesus has done all of this and then he went to heaven and he just lets us figure things out here until he gets back? John 14, 23 gives us an answer to that question. Jesus said these words, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know what that verse says? That verse says that the love of God drives God to want that for us. It's not us making it up and then wanting God to do that for us. It's him. That's what he, he came for, a love relationship with us. So the answer is an enthusiastic yes. It's why we put this in our definition of a disciple. It's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus when you're a follower and companion. Hear, hear the words there for keeping Jesus and walking in a relationship. A follower and companion of Jesus who becomes more like Jesus as he loves like Jesus and leads others to follow Jesus. It's what it means. A life of togetherness with Christ by eyes of faith really believing that Jesus is right here among us. Present at world gospel and individually Cultivating a relationship is like getting to know that family member that's always around but you never talk with. <laughs> have you ever had that person in your life where they just have always, you know, sort of been invisible to you? And it's like that. It's like Jesus was always here. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, put it this way. He said, there is no place that God is not. That's a way of saying God's everywhere, right? Right? Our awareness of God is the problem, and it's acute. You see how awareness and attention is coming into this about Jesus and our relationship with him? By seeing through eyes of faith, we can know the immediate and constant presence of Jesus, unwavering and faithful as he has promised it to be. Whether we're in different company or in a different place, whether we're all by ourselves, this is the basis of a life being yoked to him and following him. When we live our lives in the presence of the king of kings, it's natural that we want to, to receive his word and keep it, as John 14, 23 said. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, listen. He's saying, attend to me, pay attention, live this out by my strength and my guidance. Another thing that I ran across from John Mark Comer that was helpful for me was this, that what you give your attention to is who you become. So practically speaking, what you love most and want most is what you give your attention to. But your attention is also what you give, what you, what you give your attention to is actually your life. Does that make sense? What you give your attention to is actually what you're living. And so when Jesus is saying, hang on to me, turn to me, open the door to me, live life with me, he's saying, give me your attention. But this world is, is they're looking for our attention, isn't it? The, the, the flashy images, the algorithms that provide us an infinite feed so that we never have to turn our attention to anything else other than things that delight us and interest us over and over and over again. Pictures of the good life that capture our imaginations and longings. And Jesus is saying through these letters, hear the word, give your attention to me. For a church where our love for Jesus is alive, where our courage and boldness in the face of suffering is strong, where the voices of those even in the church who would lead us away into idolatry and immorality are drowned out, where the vibrancy of our worship and works in Jesus are full, where the name of Jesus is not just a, 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 a logo for us, but is our, is our true banner, where substance of our faith and holiness are radiant, it will be because we have turned our attention to Jesus and we have made our lives about attending to him. So what's holding you back, I wonder? 
What's holding us back? Is it maybe you're saying, Ben, I, I just can't hear God's voice. Can I encourage you? You've heard it this morning. It's written on the page and he's here right now. Maybe you're saying, I've never experienced this before. I don't know God, God's presence like this, right? I, I don't even know if this is supposed to happen. What does this look like? I would say to you, today can be the day that you chart your course toward this. You cry out to God for this. You seek it. Maybe you're saying, I once knew this, but those days are long ago in my life. I don't know if I could ever get back there. Hear the voice of Jesus knocking on the door for you this morning saying, let me back in. I want to be there with you. I love you. And if you're saying, if you're saying, I don't have time for Jesus, I don't have time to attend to him, then can I call you to the courageous commitment to cut out whatever is in your life that would keep you from this? Break free. Jesus is calling us to vibrancy and victory, to live a life for his world and his kingdom to be a priest in his worship. Will you attach to him? Will you attend to him? Let's bow together for prayer. Oh Lord Jesus, your power and your love that are conveyed through these letters are what we need to hear. God, we approach you as humble people who know we need to hear for our own good your call to you and even your reproof in where we are turning astray or losing attention. We pray, O oh God, that all of those things that would draw us from attending to you, from turning our attention to you, you would, you would break the beauty of those things in our eyes and their attractiveness and our compulsion to them. And instead, Lord, return us to reality by by attaching to you and living in the reality of your closeness, that we would truly be your disciples, that we would truly be those who live in your victor, your victory and in your conquering. We pray these things in your powerful name and we trust in the answer to this prayer by the goodness of your love. Amen.